Welcome to the worship service this afternoon. It is wonderful to see so many family and friends here with us today. As a congregation, we rejoice together with the families and friends of the young adults that will be publicly confessing their faith this afternoon. We welcome Pastor Mark Wagner as he leads us, leads this service. For announcements, we will be uh, leading these young adults to the back under the tent and we will give opportunity for everyone to uh, congratulate them and wish them blessings. Second offering, offering for today will be for the seminary fund. Our call to worship is from Psalm 28, verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him. I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. And with my song, I will praise him. Let us sing together Psalm 251, verses 1, 2, and 3. Dear congregation, as we have once again gathered to worship the Lord, we draw near to him, confessing that our help is in the name of the Lord, who has made the heavens and the earth. Amen. Receive the Lord's greeting. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, 
the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us sing to Christ's praise from Psalter 51, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Psalter 51, all three stanzas. Congregation, family, and friends, uh, today we have the great joy and privilege of witnessing the public confession of faith of six of our young people. And so I would like to ask our six young people to now come forward for that. If you can face the congregation lining up somewhere from here in a half semicircle, that direction, I'll stand over there if that's okay. So, sorry, more that way. That's, that's great. So we have four questions that we'd like to ask you, and then we will receive your answer. Number one, do you believe the truth of God, which is revealed in the Old and New Testament and confessed in the articles of the Christian faith and taught here in this Christian church to be the true and complete doctrine of salvation? Number two, do you promise by the grace of God steadfastly to continue in the confession of this truth of God and to live and die therein? Question three, do you confess that you abhor and humble yourself before God because of your sins and that you seek your life outside of yourself in Jesus Christ and do you desire to celebrate the Lord's Supper for the strengthening of your faith? Number four, do you confess that it is your heartfelt desire by the power of the Holy Spirit to love the Lord your God and to serve him according to his word, to manifest yourself as a faithful member of the church of Christ, to contribute to the upbuilding of his church, 
to confess his name in the world and to submit yourself willingly to the pastoral supervision and the discipline of the church. What is your answer, Andrea Decourt? The text I have chosen for you is Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So sister, may the eternal, unchanging love of God be the center and foundation of your life. What is your answer, Joshua Koopman? Yes. Revelation 1, 5b through 6. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And brother, may that be the direction of your life as well. To him who washed us and to him be the glory. And what is your answer, Jedediah Otten? Yes. Romans 5, 1 and 2, a text that you memorized for this class. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And so, brother, keep standing on this precious truth of justification by faith alone in Christ alone, and let that be your reason for rejoicing. What is your answer, Jesselyn Otten? 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so, sister, already now we have the astounding privilege of being called children of God, but then, then we will see him. And so keep looking forward. What is your answer, Rachel Wagter? 2 Thessalonians 2.16 May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So sister, Jesus our Savior has loved us and has voluntarily given himself for us so that our lives might reflect that as well in our words, and in our works. And what is your answer, Rebecca Wagter? Ephesians three seventeen through 19. That Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And sister, you have shown that you love to study and to dig into God's truth. And so keep digging into this one thing, to know the love of Christ, which passes all understanding. Well, dear brothers and sisters, it is an amazing grace of God that you can be here this afternoon to give your yes to these weighty and, and solemn questions. As we go through those questions and we think about what this all means, and yet to stand here today at the front and not only before the congregation, but before God, to give your yes. And I said that's a sign of God's amazing grace, because we all have grown up in Christian homes, and yet, in various ways, he has led you to be able to say, from your heart, yes, this is true, and yes, I want to live this way. And so on behalf of the consistory and church family, uh, we extend a hearty welcome to you as full confessing members of our congregation, and especially uh, we look forward with you to celebrating the Lord's Supper. 
Well, let me leave you with the benediction of Paul in Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And so, brothers and sisters, this is how we move forward with the God of hope in front of us and enabled by the Spirit who gives us hope. And so, congregation, may that also be then our prayers and our desire for, this, uh, for these young brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let us sing to God's praise, rejoicing in his faithfulness. We'll do that standing, singing from Psalter 241, 1 through 4. 241, 1 through 4. Our scripture reading for this afternoon service is found in the epistle of Paul to the Philippians. And we like to read chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Philippians 3, verses 1 through 16. This is found on page... 1,804 in the Pew Bible, Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Our text will come from verses 12 through 16. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. 
Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Thus far, the reading of God's holy and infallible word, may he add his blessing to it. Congregation, at this time, we would like to unite ourselves with the church of all ages and all places, reciting together the Apostles' Creed, Answering that question, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now go to our triune God in prayer. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are the great, faithful, triune God. And Lord, you are the God who builds your church. You are the God who saves sinners. You are the God of redemption. Father, in your mercy and eternal love, you have chosen a people for your dear Son. And in time, you sent your Son that he might live for them, that he might die for them, that he might rise again for them, that he might ascend and ever reign at your right hand for them. And from that place, Lord Jesus, you have poured out your Spirit. And how precious your Spirit is, your Spirit who gives life to dead sinners, your Spirit who enables your children to walk in obedience, your Spirit who gives growth. When left to ourselves, there would be no growth. Lord, your Word tells us that it's only by the Spirit that we can confess the name of Christ. And Lord, we thank you then for your mercies and your faithfulness 
in enabling us to hear the confession of six young people. Lord, we thank you for Andrea DeCourt and Joshua Koopman and Jed Otten and Jesselyn Otten and Rachel and Rebecca Wagter. Lord, we pray that you would bless them in every way, that you would help them to be faithful by your grace and by your help to the answer that they have just given, to the promise that they have just made. Lord, we pray that this very service would be used by you in their lives to help them to press on in the Christian life. Lord, bless the very act of confessing their faith and also the words that are spoken and the songs that are sung and the prayers that are lifted up and the fellowship that's enjoyed. Lord, use all of these things as a means to bolstering their hope and strengthening them as they live in this world. Lord, we pray this uh, for each of us who confess the name of Christ. Uh, Lord, what, what a blessing it is to, to think of your mercies to, to all of your children, that you care for us, that you provide for us. And though we often sin against you, Lord, your forgiveness is real and your spirit is real. And it's by your spirit that we are slowly and progressively changed more and more into the image of Christ. Lord, we thank you for the families that have gathered here and for the friends, for all of our visitors. We thank you for our congregation also, which has been influential in the lives of these young people. And Lord, we pray that you would help each one of us to learn what it is to rejoice in the Lord more and more. Lord, for those who are here who don't confess the name of Christ or who don't confess that name in truth, that, that they would learn this very afternoon what it is to do that and what it means to be a sinner saved by grace, to be washed in the blood, and to be helped by your Spirit. Lord, do that work also through the preaching of the Word. We pray that it would come with power, that it would come with personal application, and that you would help us, O oh Lord, to receive your word uh, with hungry hearts, ready to, to learn from you and to live in obedience to you. Lord, we thank you for this moment in the life of our church as well as we see your faithfulness to us here in Zion, that you have enabled us to witness uh, six more confessing members to join us. And uh, Lord, we praise you for that. We pray that you would continue to deepen our faith here and deepen our holiness and that you would continue to add to our numbers, Lord, as you have done today. Lord, we thank you for the years of teaching that these young people have received in the home and in the church and elsewhere. And we pray that the seed that's been sown would continue to bear fruit in their lives. Lord, that as they move forward from this place, that there would be evidence, evidences of uh, growth in grace, of growing love for the Lord Jesus, and a desire to, to live wholeheartedly for him. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless uh, each one of us. Uh, we pray for uh, our federation as well again, and Lord, we pray that you would look on us. We thank you for the many faithful churches in the area that preach the word. We pray for all gospel preachers, wherever they are, that you would encourage them, that you would give much of your grace and spirit to them to proclaim the word in truth. And Lord, that you would continue to build your church. We thank you that it's not confined to this place. And we pray then that you would cause your kingdom to come, that through the gospel uh, here in Canada, that your church would be built up but also around the world that uh, you would bless uh, mission work, that you would bless the persecuted church. Lord, we pray also in a special way for the PRTS, Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary, as we take a collection for the seminary fund. Lord, we see that the harvest is white, the laborers are few, and so send forth more laborers into your harvest 
Lord, may there be more gospel preachers and may they go with, with joy at sowing the seed and also seeing the fruit of their labors in due time. Lord, we also pray for our government. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the peaceful election we were able to have this week. We pray your blessing over our leaders. Lord, we pray that you would give them wisdom. We pray that you would give them humility, repentance, and, and a desire to follow you and to live according to your commands. And Lord, as, uh, as a nation, may there also be a turning back to you that at every level that we might see your Spirit's reviving grace. And Lord, then begin with us also. We thank you, Lord, that we also uh, have answered prayers and that we prayed for uh, Rashida of uh, Rogan Den Hill uh, last week. And, and Lord, we're thankful to hear that she's doing somewhat better. We pray that you would continue to strengthen her and that she would have her health uh, restored in due time. Lord, we come to you as poor and needy people who need your grace, as, the, as those who need your word in order to live. Your word is more precious than gold, and it's sweeter than honey. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would take your word and apply it to our hearts and minds. We pray this all, confessing our sins, looking to the Lord Jesus Christ, and drawing near to the Father in boldness through him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, congregation, at this time, we have the opportunity to give to the Lord from our gifts. And our second collection is for the seminary fund. Following that, we'll sing from Psalter 175, stanzas 1 through 4. Psalter 175, all four stanzas titled Personal Testimony.
Congregation, we can turn our Bibles again to Philippians chapter 3. I'd like to read verses 12 through 14. Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14. There, the Apostle Paul writes, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Congregation, in the opening verses of this chapter, the Apostle Paul has given us something of his own personal testimony. Uh, Here we find his confession of how God, by his grace, has made a difference in his life. And, And as we read from chapter 3, verses 1 through verse 11, we find that it's, it's very personal. Uh, Paul is speaking from his heart. Uh, this is Paul sharing his longings, his deepest desires. And so by the end of verse 11, it's crystal clear that Jesus Christ is absolutely supreme in Paul's life. Notice he speaks in verse 8 of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. What awesome words those are. The excellency, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. And so this is Paul's great longing. This is why he keeps crying out. It's like, it's like his heart is beating and he keeps crying out, I want to know him. I want to love him. I want to gain him. I want to be found in him. This is the goal of his life. To state it simply, Paul's goal as he views the Christian life, as he views his own life, his goal is to know Christ in the fullest way possible on this side of glory and then to look forward to his future of knowing Christ perfectly on the other side of glory. That's Paul and his goal in the Christian life. And so here we find him, and he's committed himself to this. This is a commitment, this lifelong pursuit of an expanding relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the mentality of Paul. Uh, he's, he's looking forward to uh, knowing Christ now, but then seeing it, these buds of, of knowing Christ blossom into full bloom when he passes over the finish line, when he gets to glory, when he departs and goes to be with his Lord and his Savior. And so Paul's goal was the pursuit of a greater fellowship with Christ. This was his passion. This was his purpose. And brothers and sisters, you have just confessed your faith in this Christ. And in our membership classes together throughout the past year, we spent a lot of time thinking about Christ. In fact, the book we studied was titled Complete in Him, in Christ. And and so we spent a lot of time studying him and and wanting to know what it is, who who he is, and and what he's like, and what he's done for his people. And, And that knowledge is foundational. We need to know what Christ is like. That knowledge is foundational to our fellowship with him. But friends, as you know, we can't stop there. We can't stop just knowing about him, but we need to know him personally, as you have confessed. And that's what Paul is saying here. We need to pursue this. We need to live in such a way like Paul, where to live is Christ and to die then is gain. Well, having just expressed such heights in his own Christian life, Paul then transitions here in verse 12 through 16, to provide clarity and instruction for the church on what the Christian life looks like. Okay, Paul, these are your desires, these are your longings, 
But what's it like on the ground? What's it like running the race? We see the goal. We see the finish line. But what's it like as we run this race? What's the Christian's mindset? Notice that, verse 15. Paul says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And so Paul has the Christian's mind in view. The, the, the mature Christian's mind. And, and he's describing it, what it's like. What's it look like to, to run the race of faith with a mature Christian mind? What's that look like? Paul wants to see the church in Philippi, uh, who this, this gather, gathering of believers who have confessed their faith in Christ, he wants to see them grow up in their faith. He wants to see them mature. He doesn't want them forever to remain infants in grace, but he wants to see them advancing. He wants to see them growing stronger and developing. He wants them to mature in their thinking and love. And so that's the question that sets up this sermon for this afternoon then. What is the mature Christian mindset as they run the Christian race? That's what Paul explains here in verses 12 through 14. And notice our title then is Pressing On. Pressing On. And that in many ways summarizes the mindset of the Christian. Pressing On. Here in these verses, Paul is using athletic imagery as he gives this, uh, as he states these words over and over again, I press on. He's wanting us to picture a runner uh, engaging in a race. And, and children, many of you had track and field, and it's not the 100-meter dash he's thinking of. But he's thinking of this marathon, the long Christian race, this, this lifelong journey. And here's the mantra of the Christian, I press on. And so that's our title, Pressing On. And first, we want to see the Christian's awareness. The Christian's awareness. Notice verse 12. Paul says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. Now again, this is the language of one who's running the race, who sees the finish line, but who hasn't yet made it there. Uh, He's still running the race. Uh, He has the goal in mind. That goal is perfection. Paul's goal is complete conformity to Christ. He wants Christ-likeness. This is his goal as he strives after holiness. He doesn't want to be partially holy. He wants to be completely holy. He is striving after this. I want to be like Jesus. And yet notice there is this keen awareness that he has not yet attained this. This is the Christian's awareness. He says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. And so, congregation, this is the awareness of a mature Christian. This is part of the mature Christian thinking. To have this awareness, the mature Christian is one who has a right self-awareness. They know themselves. Uh, That's Paul. He's come to know himself in truth. And he says, I have not yet attained. I I know myself, and I'm not yet attained where I want to be. And so this highlights for us, then, the need for healthy self-examination and the role that that ought to have in the Christian's life. Uh, All of us have some thoughts about our spiritual state. The question is, are those true? Are those true? Do we actually know ourselves? The natural heart is is proud by nature. Uh, It's deceptive. That was Paul in his old life. Remember, as he recorded it, he thought of himself as righteous. In himself, his law-keeping, righteous. He was deceived. And yet here, he now knows himself. And so this self-examination, it's part of the Christian life. We we shouldn't be afraid of it. It's called for. Paul calls for it in in Corinthians. And in his other letters as well, he calls for this self-examination. Now, what is that? Well, it's to test ourselves, uh, to take the word of God and and to measure our progress, to know ourselves in truth. That's Paul here. Uh, He sees himself. He knows that he's not already perfected. Uh, Perfection's coming for him. That's verse 21. When Jesus uh, comes again, he will see him and, and he will be given a glorious, glorified body. But for now, he knows that's not where he is. That's not his state. And so this is exactly what the Christian finds when they do self-examination. If we know ourselves, we know that there is much room for growth. 
That's the Christian mindset. Uh, they, they see that there's much room for growth, and it, and it grieves them. Uh, they want more. Uh, as the Christian strives to live close to God, the God who is light, more and more of their darkness is revealed. And they see there's room for growth. Uh, the closer the Christian gets to Christ, the more difference they see between themselves and Christ, who they love. Uh, Christ is pure, he is perfect, he is patient, he's gentle, he's kind. Christ, as we read the Gospels, he gets angry about the right things and in the right way. Then we look at ourselves, and there's so much impurity, so much impatience, so much harshness and bitterness, and so much irrational anger and unrighteous anger. And so the Christian sighs. There's grief. I want to be like Christ. I'm not there yet. Congregation, we should take heart. This is the Apostle Paul saying this. He has just expressed his great love for Christ. And if if we are honest, we see ourselves, we see our own timidness in the faith, we see how little we've attained, and we think maybe here's a man who's far above us. Here's a man who's already been perfected. And he's saying that's not the case at all. I still have so much growth that I need. And so this is... This is the Christian's self-awareness. But how do they deal with this self-awareness? Do they just despair? Is that what self-examination is, to to despair? To turn in on themselves? To be morbid in that way? No hope. Look at me. Woe is me. I'm forever stuck like this. Well, absolutely not. That's not the Apostle Paul. No, he knows himself, but he knows himself as he's in Christ. He knows himself, and, and every examination of himself is a gospel examination. The gospel saturates that. As he looks at himself, as he sees his sin, as he sees his shortcomings, he's then fleeing out to Christ. He's running out to this Christ who is his life. Confession of Faith students, the third question actually that you answered expresses this beautifully. Let me read it for you. Do you confess that you abhor and humble yourself before God because of your sins? You're saying you know yourself. There's sins. But it doesn't stop there. And that you seek your life outside of yourself in Jesus Christ. That's not only a confession to make here today, but that's a way of life. As as the Spirit shows you more of yourself, as you examine yourself in light of the Word, and you see your failings, you see the sins in your life. You're called out to come out of yourself, to run again to the Lord Jesus, and to find your life hid in Him. And so that's Paul. He has this self-knowledge. In congregation, do we know ourselves then? A mature Christian knows himself. They know themselves as a sinner, but they know themselves as a sinner saved by grace and being transformed by the work of the Spirit. So don't just know yourself. That's key to the Christian mindset. But second, our second point is the Christian's confidence in here saying, know your God. Know your God. Yes, Paul knows himself, but he knows his God, and this is all of his reason for confidence. And there's uh, three precious soul-strengthening things that we can say here about our God and about our confidence in him. Notice, first of all, the Father calls us. Uh, The Father calls us. As we think about this Christian life and the Christian journey, uh, here's the foundation. The Father calls calls us. Look at what the apostle says. He says in verse 14, he's pressing on for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so notice that, the call of God, God's calling, God's calling on on the Christian, on their life. Uh, This word calling, it has the idea of a summons, of of a king summonsing you. And, And it's It's effectual then. It's powerful. Laced into this call is the power of life. This is not just the the general call of the gospel. This is the effectual call of our sovereign king who summons all of his children to life, to rise from the dead, first of all, and then to come home. Notice Paul says it's the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful, that that word upward? We can also put heavenly, the heavenly call. 
of God. Uh, This call, this summons, it's come through the word, by the power of the spirit, from heaven. It's come from there. That's the source, and it's calling us to heaven. That's where it's going to bring us. That's the direction that God will take his people. And although this was true of Paul in a unique way, he heard an audible voice, he saw uh, the living Christ in, in the sky, yet every Christian's call is no less real and no less guarantee. We serve the same sovereign God, and that God is the one who raises dead sinners to life and who empowers them as they live in this life. And so take heart here. The Father calls us. That's our confidence. So here you are, you have friends at the beginning, you've just confessed faith, you have your whole Christian life ahead of you, you don't know how long that is. The Lord knows. And yet where can I find confidence? When we look to ourselves and, and we see our own failings, we see how, how, how often we're half-hearted in this whole matter, Yet take confidence here. It's God's calling. God will not let any of his children go. No, he wants his people home with him in heaven. And so this is the guarantee that everyone of his people will make it home to be with him. What reason for confidence? This is the God who will complete his work in us. The father calls a second. The son keeps us. The son keeps us. Notice again, it's the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That, that's telling us, Paul is reminding us of one of his favorite things to remind us of, that every bit of salvation, every part of salvation is located in this one person. It's in Christ Jesus. Uh, if there's forgiveness of sins, it's found in Christ If there's adoption into the family of God, it's found through knowing Christ. If there's to be the Spirit in our life, it comes in Christ. And so what again, what reason for confidence? Because the Christian's existence is bound up in Christ. This is the security, the security of the gospel, our union with our Christ. And to think practically then, we just had Ascension Day. Christ has ascended to glory. He finished his earthly race. He ran that race perfectly. And he went to heaven and he was welcomed home. And that right there, seeing Christ with his real body ascend into heaven and be welcomed by the saints and angels and ultimately by the Father himself, that is a guarantee that every single one who is in Christ, they too will be welcomed home to glory. And so as you run the Christian race, do so with Christ in view, with the security of having this Christ as your Christ. And so yes, while every Christian will deal with much indwelling sin, there's much lagging behind on this race. There's, much, uh, there's many different distractions. We often get lost in the weeds. And we, we lose the path. Uh, there's, there's fainting. There's tiredness. Uh, We feel we can't take another step. We're overwhelmed with life's journey. The marathon seems too long. The sun is beating too hot. We haven't had enough water. That's what the Christian life often feels like. We're, We're gasping for breath. And yet here God is holding out Christ. Here's your security. Your life is hid in him. But even more, notice the other language Paul uses to highlight our confidence in Christ. Uh, You see that when he speaks in verse 12. He says, But I press on that I may lay hold of that, now listen to this, for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Isn't that amazing language? Christ Jesus has first laid hold of me. And if I'm going to lay hold of anything, if I'm going to press on in the Christian life, that first Knowledge of Christ laying hold of me comes first. That is the power source. Uh, And so Paul here is picturing Christ as the one who has sought us. Uh, He's the one who's left heaven. He's found us. Uh, We were like the drowning swimmers. Our boat had capsized. Uh, We were there drowning in that desperate place. And yet Christ entered the treacherous waters. 
Christ laid hold of us. Christ sought us. He brought us to shore. And he won't let his people go. This is our Savior. He keeps. He keeps his people. He shed his blood for us. He continually intercedes for us. And so none can snatch us from the hand of this Christ. What reason for confidence? Not only the Father and the Son, but third, also the Spirit. The Spirit spurs us on. Now, Paul doesn't explicitly mention the Spirit here, but he knows from other of his passages of Scripture, he knows very consciously that he is an instrument in the Spirit's hands. And and as he preaches and as he writes the God-breathed word, uh, he knows that the Spirit is ministering through him. And that's exactly what the Spirit loves to do. The Spirit loves to take the word. In fact, this is what he ordinarily does. He takes the word of God and he uses it to either comfort us when we're grieving or to convict us when we're leaving him. And so the Spirit, he spurs us on. He takes a text like this one so that we might run the race to glory. The Spirit is here in his word saying, press on, press on, don't lag, don't grow weary, don't give up, but move forward, advance, strive, lay hold. And child of God, how often in your Christian life have you not found that to be true? That the Spirit spurs us on. Maybe you're in that place of of grief. You're you're despairing, but then the word comes to us. Uh, Maybe it's in our own daily devotions or it's in the preaching of the word and and a word just hits us right and and suddenly we have hope again. Uh, The sun is shining on our soul and and now we can get up, we can move, we can can press on. Or at other times, you've grown lazy spiritually. Uh, You have been distracted. Uh, You've wandered off the path and yet the preaching comes or the word comes and it's sharp. And it's the spirit holding the sword of of the word and, and he's cutting and he's doing it because he loves his people. He wants them to press on. The spirit wants his people to get to heaven. And so he uses the means of the preaching, the sacraments, the word to drive us home to glory. Apart from the work of the Spirit, we have no life. We cannot advance. Uh, He is the sap that flows from the vine, from Christ, to us to give us vitality, to give us life, to make us fruit-bearing. And the Spirit, he loves to work in the lives of his people. So don't despise, then, the work of the Spirit. Do not grieve him. Don't ignore his prompts. But listen to him as he speaks in his word. Well, this is Paul. This is the mindset of a mature Christian. They are one who has a a keen self-awareness, a keen sense of their sin, but they also are one who is full-eyed, wide open to their God, their triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's their reason for confidence. They don't run this race thinking that they will somehow lose. No, they have confidence Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's wearying. Yes, we're slow. But our God, he is for us. And if he is for us, who can be against us? This then takes us to the final point, the Christian pursuit. Not only the Christian awareness and the Christian confidence, but now finally the Christian pursuit. Paul says over and over again, I press on. That's verse 12. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. And so here's the first thing we need to notice is the intensity. Paul is our running coach, and he's saying, press on. I do it. I'm the example of, of the Christian life, and I want you to do it as well. He's speaking to the church in Philippi, and God is speaking to us here. Press on, Christians. Are we intense about our Christianity? Personally, about our sanctification, about our holiness, about our pursuit of Christ. Listen to the intensity of Paul. I press on. Is that your intensity today? Or have we grown tired? Have we grown lazy? 
The word uh, surgate, it's Latin. If you ever studied at Brock University, you notice that that's one of their uh, slogans, surgate. And it means this, push on, press on. And it was the last words of Sir Isaac Brock, the general, in his battle, as he was fighting on the field. He was saying, press on, press on. And that's Paul here saying, for the Christian, it's a warfare. Uh, We don't wage war against flesh and blood. We fight against Satan. We fight against uh, the principalities. We fight against our own sin. And so be warlike. Press on. That's the intensity. Second, the strategy. Well, how do we do this? Paul tells us, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal. And so notice, concentration is required. Paul says, there's one thing I do. He is zeroed in. He is focused. And he's looking forward. He's forgetting those things that are behind and he's reaching forward like the runner. It's, it's a relay race. The baton is right in front of you. They're about to pass it. You're not looking over your shoulder. You're looking forward. You're reaching. You're pressing forward. I don't want to drop the ball. I don't want to drop the baton. That's Paul. He's concentrating. He's pressing forward. Now, what's it mean that he forgets those things that are behind? Well, It's absolutely right and appropriate to look back on God's past mercies. That's not what Paul is talking about. And so confession of faith, students, this is something that I hope you do today with your family, with your friends. You think back on God's past mercies. How did we get to this point? It's good to look back at those things. Uh, That actually gives us fuel and encouragement and strength to press on. When we see God has been faithful in the past and he's the same God and he will be with me in the future. Paul agrees with that wholeheartedly. Notice that in this chapter, Paul is reflecting on God's past mercies. He described his old way of life. He was headed for hell. He was headed for condemnation, and he was blind to it. But because of the grace of God, God intervened, and now he's a different man. And Paul finds strength in that. He reflects on the various ways that that God has, has upheld him, And has given him this new desire. And so for us, then today as well, think back at the various points of your life where God kept you from making shipwreck, choosing a different life, or or, or reflect on how God softened your heart at different points and in different ways to, to love the Lord Jesus, to come after him, to seek him, and to find him. And so Paul is not talking about forgetting God's past faithfulness. But Paul is talking about uh, forgetting those things that hinder our progress as we pursue sanctification. In congregation, how many things there are that hinder our progress? Things that we should be forgetting, but that we keep looking back at, and they're slowing us down and tripping us up. Uh, How often we look back by holding on to bitterness against things that have been done against us, past wrongs, this bitterness, this root of bitterness. Uh, we keep hanging on to it and, it, and it hurts our spiritual progress. Now, maybe things need to be dealt with, maybe things need to be resolved and addressed, then do so in a Christian way. But kill bitterness because it, it hinders our pursuit of Christ. Or, or despairing over past sins. We see what we've done in the past. We think back to maybe that, that particular sin and, and it haunts us, and it hurts our assurance. It, it weakens us, because can, can Christ, is his blood really sufficient to cover that sin? And Paul's saying, yes, it is. Press on. Put that behind you. God has taken your sin, and he has placed it in the depths of the sea. He has separated you as far from the east as from the west from them. And so press on. Replaying our past failures does not help us often in our pursuit of Christ. The more and more we have regrets and and we think about these things and mull over these things, the less likely we are to rest in our our Father's providential leading. And so how Satan loves to unleash these things at our heels, like snapping dogs that that are coming after us, distracting us, that we keep looking back, 
and we're tripping up and slowing down. But Paul says this is baggage. It needs to be brought to the foot of the cross and, and press on. Press on. Look forward. Look forward. And that's the last thing then, the prize. The prize. Paul keeps on talking about pressing forward towards the goal. I press towards the goal. And so, child of God, we need to set the prize in view. Frequently, we need to remind ourselves that heaven is real and that hell is real and that Jesus is real and there is a throne and I want to be around that throne. I want to be praising this Christ. I want to be casting my crown at his feet. That's the prize, to be with him. And Paul, he sees it, he knows it. Uh, and so later in this, this chapter, he weeps over the enemies of the cross. He weeps for their soul. They're going to hell. He weeps for them. But then he sees Christ coming, and, and that enables him to press on. He knows that he's going to heaven. His citizenship is in heaven. That's his home. Uh, he's received this heavenly call. The Father is calling him home. And so he's running to win. Just like the Olympian intentionally will think about the gold medal before they run the race. I, I, I want to see myself in the number one place, gold medal around my neck. They envision it. They envision all the ways that the race can go so they could be there. And Paul is saying to, to Christians, live that way. Live with heaven in front of you. Live running, pursuing this full and perfect fellowship with Jesus. Already in this life, be knowing him and enjoying him, but be looking for what is, what's ahead and what's to come. And so in closing then, what direction are you headed? What, what's the direction of your life? Are you going this way? Are you going to glory? Well, how do I know? Well, are you going to Christ today? Is your heart saying, I want him. I need him. I love him. I'm following him. That is the sure sign of the direction we're headed. And that's the only way to run. Notice verse 16, Paul warns about backsliding. He warns about falling back. He's saying, don't let go of the rope. Don't lose what you've already gained. Confession of faith, students, we've learned much this past year. Don't lose what you've gained. Press on and press forward until you meet the Lord Jesus Christ and cast your crown at his feet. Well, may God... Help us to be there on that final day. Amen. Let us sing out of response Psalter 7, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Psalter 7, all three stanzas.
Let us close in Thanksgiving prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for your mercy and for your eternal love. Father, we thank you for your call upon all of your children, your life-giving call, your powerful summons that will bring us home. We thank you for Christ who keeps us, who holds us, who's laid hold of us in coming into this world, who's died for his people, that they might forever live with him. And we thank you for your spirit, who at times comforts us and who at times convicts us as he spurs us on through life's journey. And Lord, we pray then that you would bless every Christian here and especially those who have confessed their faith today. Lord, we pray that you would encourage them and strengthen them that they might know themselves, but that they might know their God and press on home to heaven. And Lord, for those of us who don't know you, who find ourselves apart from Christ, may we come to him today. May we not delay. May we see the realities of life and death. And may we find our lives also then hid in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you again that we can all be here this afternoon and For those who couldn't be here but maybe are listening online or over church telephone, we pray your blessing on them as well and help us now to enjoy good fellowship and to go into this week applying your word and trusting you and living for your glory. Forgive what was sinful, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our closing Psalter is Psalter 52, stanzas 1 through 4, singing of the guardian care of God. Psalter 52, 1 through 4, and we'll sing that standing.
Following the benediction, we'll sing for doxology. Uh, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Receive the Lord's blessing. Go to your homes and into this week in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.